Good morning to everyone. Good morning. Welcome to this act of worship of said Eucharist and reciting of hymns. Let us pray. In the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God, come to our assistance. Cleanse our hearts from an evil vein of distracting thoughts. The sisters to celebrate this Holy Eucharist with reverence, attention, and devotion. For it is offered to you through Jesus Christ, O oh Lord. Uh, amen. We begin with the hymn number one. Number one. At thy feet, O Christ, we lay thine own gift of this new day. Doubt of what it holds in store makes us crave thine aid the more. Let us prove a time of loss, mark its Savior with thy cross. If it flow and calm and bright, be thyself our chief delight. If it bring unknown distress, good is all that thou canst bless. Only while its hours begin, pray we keep them clear of sin. We in part our weakness know, and in part discern our foe. Well for us before thine eyes, all our danger open lies. Turn not from us why we plead, thy compassions and our need. Fain would we thy word embrace, live each moment on thy grace. All selves to thee consign, hold up all our wills in thine. Think and speak and do and be simply that which pleases thee. Hear us, Lord, and that right soon. Hear and grant the choicest boon that thy love can e'er impart. Loyal singleness of heart. So shall this and all our days, Christ our God, support thy praise. That God chose to make known how great among the nations are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This act of worship now continues on page 101 of the little book. Please turn to page 101. The blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. And blessed be his kingdom now and forever. Amen. Alleluia. Alleluia. Blessed Lord and Father, we have assembled in your name and in fellowship with one another. Enable us by your grace to offer the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, to proclaim and respond to your holy word, teach us to pray for your world and your church, Grant that we, confessing our sins, may worthily offer to you our souls and bodies as a living sacrifice, and eat and drink of your spiritual food in this holy sacrament. Amen. The Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb 
of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit. In the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, the shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, with you and the Holy Spirit, lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the ministry of the word. A reading from the first book of Samuel, chapter 3, verses 1 to 10, 11 to 20. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. The visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house, from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice, offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son, he said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The appointed psalm is Psalm 39, Psalm 139, reading verses 1 to 5 and 12 to 17, Psalm 139, verses 1 to 5, 
and 12 to 17. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You discern my thoughts from afar. Indeed, there is not a word on my lip, but you, O Lord, know it all together. You press upon me behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful, and I know it well. My God has not hidden from you. While I was in distress and only in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. They were fashioned day by day, when as yet there were none of them. How deep I find your thoughts, O oh God! How great is the sum of them! If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like years. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Second reading is taken from the letter of Paul to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1, chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. 1 Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 12 to 20. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. The God raised the Lord, the God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. The gradual 216 to 16. Come, thou almighty King, help us thy name to sing. Help us to praise Father whose love unknown all things created own. Build in our hearts thy throne 
ancient of days. Come, thou incarnate word, by heaven and earth adored, our prayer attended. Come, and thy people bless. Come, give thy word success. Establish thy righteousness, Savior and friend. Come, holy comforter, thy sacred witness there in this glad hour. Thou, who almighty art, now rule in every heart, and near from us depart, spirit of power. To thee, great one in three, the highest praises be henceforth evermore. Thy sovereign majesty, may we in glory see, and to eternity love and adore. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to Christ our Savior. St. John chapter 1, beginning at the 43rd verse. And it came to pass that Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You'll see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. So this is the gospel of Christ. Praise Christ. Could you please be seated? Today being the second Sunday after the Epiphany, I've chosen words from the collect set aside for this day to direct our thoughts. I invite you, therefore, to turn in your liturgy book to page 160, and we read together the words for the second Sunday after the Epiphany. Read together, Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacrament, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, and forever. Amen. And the words to direct our thoughts are, grant your people illumined by your word and sacraments may shine the radiance of Christ's glory that he may be known worshipped and obeyed 
to the ends of the earth. I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Grant that your people illumined by your word and sacraments may shine the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. As we continue our journey in the season of the Epiphany, in which we reflect on how God was and is manifested in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, and more so how the church calls us and challenges us to mirror a similar understanding in our living as sons and daughters to ensure that by our daily living we become the manifestation of God to all and sundry. The readings set aside for today offer us great advice and also a great challenge as to how we fulfill this demand that our baptismal promises place on us. When we look at the first reading taken from Samuel, it is a well-known exposition of the young prophet-to-be, Samuel, having his first encounter with Yahweh, Almighty God, under the tutelage of uh, Eli. Very important to note that Samuel is in the house of the Lord. He lives there with Eli. Eli is the priest of God. And yet, God calls to Samuel three times before Eli, the priest of God, is able to perceive that God is calling or God is active even in his house of worship, the temple. It is also very instructive, the conversation between God and Samuel eventually, and the charge that is brought against the priest of God, Eli. And the charge is simply this, that Eli had grown so complacent in his duties as the priest of God at the temple of God that he didn't even have the energy nor the authority to admonish his two sons, Hophni and Phineas when they were misbehaving in the house of God. The same Eli who initially was full of all the vigor and zeal pursuing God's will had grown tired and complacent over time. And one of the points that comes out here to us today is a point that simply says that being in the service of God is a constant thing that must be done with the same zeal and energy from the very beginning. And there's no room for complacency. One must be constantly renewing, energizing, refueling oneself in the knowledge, the will, and the work of Almighty God. We notice when we move away from the first reading into the gospel reading, we begin to get closer to a very, the very point we want to pay attention to today. The point of how do we remain active 
in the service of God. How are we constantly energized so that we are able to bring others to know, to love, and to serve God? Our passage from the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, picks up with Jesus leaving the Jordan and heading to Galilee for the actual ministry that is about to begin. But if we were to turn to the Gospel of St. John, in the passages prior to where we started, there is an interesting byplay that takes place there that leads on to today's passage. Jesus is walking along the Jordan, and John the Baptist sees him and says to two of his disciples, that's John's disciples, there goes the Lamb of God. And the two disciples immediately went to Jesus and asked the question, where do you abide? Modern translations put, where do you live? But that translation misses the point. The original term abide there spoke of more than just the physical place of abode where one lives, but rather it speaks about in what, in whom are you grounded and what directs your everyday living and thoughts. And Jesus' response there is, come and see. Not just a matter of coming and physically noting where he resided for the night, but rather, come and observe and discern for yourself by his life example where his center is, what guides and directs him. We are told by John that disciples went, they saw, and the next day they went to bring Nathaniel to come to meet Jesus. And it is at this point that the words of our collect begin to be instructive to us. For not only did they bring Nathaniel to see Jesus, but Nathaniel, like the other disciples at that time, having observed Jesus, was able to discern, you are the Son of God, and literally to worship him. And it is in that context, therefore, we see being held before us the whole understanding and the notion that those who are in Jesus Christ, who have come to know Jesus Christ, must remain constant in him so that they are illuminated by him and by their life and example, others come to know about Jesus Christ, to worship and to obey him. Hence the words of the collect. Grant that those who have been illuminated by your word and sacrament may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory. Illuminated by word and sacrament. So today, Jesus is not here with us physically, but he's here with us in word and sacrament. And uh, it is in this sense, therefore, that the church has this understanding of the need for word and sacrament to be held together with the notion that that is the recipe for the constant illumination of those who have come to know Christ, so that unlike Eli, they will not saga in the life journey of living for Jesus, being the manifestation of God to all and sundry in all times and in all seasons until this physical journey comes to an end. This therefore calls for us 
to spend some time and reflect on how the church brings together word and sacrament to ensure that we are nourished and illuminated. I want at this point in time to review again this understanding of sacrament and uh, to look at the two great sacraments as inaugurated by Jesus Christ. And last Sunday, we looked at the first one, that being baptism. But today, we will look at Eucharist and to see how Eucharist brings together word and sacrament for the ongoing illumination of every baptized member, everyone baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, so that they may shine for others to come to know Almighty God. They may be the manifestation of God. Let us just refresh our memory about a sacrament. And uh, I ask you to turn to page 409 in the liturgy book. And we look at the sacraments there. And we refresh ourselves. You may read as I ask the question. What are the sacraments? The sacraments are outward and visible signs of inward and spiritual grace given by Christ as a sure and certain means by which we receive that grace. Outward, visible signs that serve as the guarantee of the grace of God which is given to us. Outward, visible signs that indicate, that point towards the fact of God's grace active among us. And again, what is grace? Grace is God's favor towards us, unearned and undeserved. By grace, God forgives our sins, enlighten our minds, stir our hearts, and strengthen our will. You notice here how grace, therefore, is in one sense an energizer that keeps us going, strengthens our will, stir our hearts, keeps us excited about this journey in Christ. So let us move immediately then to the Holy Eucharist as the second sacrament. Page 410, 117, and I ask the question, what is the Holy Eucharist? The Holy Eucharist is the sacrament commanded by Christ for the continual remembrance of his death and resurrection until his coming again. And what is the inward and spiritual grace in Eucharist? That's 121. The inward and spiritual grace in the Holy Communion is the body and blood of Christ given to his people and received by faith. And what is the outward and visible sign of the Eucharist? 120. The outward and visible sign in the Eucharist is the bread and wine consecrated, given, and received according to Christ's command. And I want us to spend some time here before moving on because there is a notion that is false among many Christians and even among some of us here worshiping at Holy Trinity about Holy Communion and the receiving of the Sacrament of Holy Communion. Let me just say this, that the Holy Communion and receiving of the Sacrament is not about how righteous anyone is. It's not about being sinless. For if it, if it was about that, not even me as your priest will be able to celebrate the Eucharist because the gospel reminds us that all of us have sinned 
and have fallen short of the glory of God. First and foremost, let us understand that Holy Communion, as we mention here, as instituted by Jesus Christ, has three basic components to it. First of all, in participating in the sacrament, we are being obedient to Jesus' command. Secondly, as we participate in this sacrament, we are bearing a witness or a testimony to what we believe about God's grace towards all of mankind. And thirdly, when we participate in the whole Eucharist, we are recounting and recalling what God in his love has done for mankind and has done it not because mankind deserves it, but rather because God is the first move of it. When we look in the gospel readings, especially that of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as we look towards the Last Supper there, we see Jesus instituting the sacrament of Holy Communion. But more of great importance is the passage of St. Luke chapter 22, about verse 19. And if you have your Bible, it will be worth the effort to look at it. For in this passage, not only does he say that this is his body given for forgiveness and all of that, but he ends by saying, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. And depending the version that you're using, you probably will see there, as often as you do this, you should support my death until I come again. My brothers and my sisters, let us get this wrong notion out of our head about why we ought not to receive communion or receive communion. It is not about your righteousness. It is not about my righteousness. It is not about your sinlessness nor my sinlessness. It has everything to do with the fact that we are sinners. And remember, as a sacrament, it is the outward and visible sign of God's grace towards us. And every time we come to the altar and receive the sacrament, whenever it is, it is celebrated, we are, first of all, being obedient to the command, do this in remembrance of me. We are secondly stating to the world that we believe that God in his love gave me the gift of his son so that I can be liberated from all my sins. And thirdly, I'm recalling how God in Jesus Christ did exactly that. The converse is therefore true. That every time we come to an act of worship in which the Eucharist is celebrated and we refuse to receive the sacrament, this is what we are saying. First of all, Jesus, go to hell. I will not obey you. Secondly, you are saying, I don't believe that your sacrifice of body and blood liberates me and thirdly i don't believe that god sent you so that you may die for the forgiveness of my sins people let us be real about this that is the reality let us go back over this because it is extremely important and as your priest and pastor i'm usually terribly disturbed when I see that the Eucharist is celebrated there may be 50 people at church and only 10 receive the sacrament why? why did you come to church in the first instance? if there's a sacrament being offered whereby as found in scripture not my words 
as my predecessor would have said, it is there in the Bible. Go and read it for yourself and pay particular attention to St. Luke chapter 22, verses 19. For in there, you will see the statement about the body and blood made by Jesus, and you'll also see the statement where he says, do this in remembrance of me. At the heart, therefore, of the sacrament, Eucharist, feeding on the body and blood of Jesus Christ to keep us illuminated in the ways of Jesus Christ. And so, having touched this aspect of a Eucharist, I want us now to look at how the church in fulfilling this prayer about word and sacrament, about shining with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known and worshipped. I wanted to see how in the wisdom of the church, as it sets out the rite of Holy Communion, how all of these come together in worship. And even as we speak about the worship, let me just remind us something about the Anglican way of worship. For the Anglican way of worship, among other things, not only does it give honor and glory to God and recognize his lordship, but it also acts as a means of teaching mankind, teaching us, teaching you, and teaching me how we ought to think about God, how we ought to relate to God, and how we ought to relate to all that God has created. And so you will notice that Anglican worship goes through a range of things, it brings to bear all the senses because it is a holistic approach and it also at different times sets out the type of posture we ought to assume whether it is a time for us to stand a time for us to sit a time for us to kneel but all of that is in the context of teaching us about Almighty God, how we ought to think about Him, how we ought to relate to Him, and how we ought to relate to others, so that we, we, we remain illuminated, remain active, remain energized in knowing and doing the will of God. So if you were to turn in your liturgy book, and let us look at, from about page 100, and one, I'm just going to touch some aspects of it as they relate to constant nurture. One of the things you notice immediately on page 101 is our statement of intent, which is a reminder of why we come together to worship. And let us read together. Blessed Lord and Father, we have assembled in your name and in fellowship with one another. Enable us by your grace to offer the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, to proclaim and respond to your holy word, teach us to pray for your world and your church. Grant that we, confessing our sins, we worthily offer to you our souls and bodies as a living sacrifice and eat and drink of your spiritual food in this holy sacrament. It, the church immediately through that prayer calls to mind the necessity for us to live in union one with another and almighty God. It also speaks of the necessity for us to understand who we are relative to God in terms of holiness and even in terms of our sinfulness but it also immediately reminds us about God's grace to us and prepares us 
for the participation in that. And so immediately after that, you have the general confession. In a sense, referred to the collect of purity, acknowledging that there's nothing you can hide from God. Absolutely nothing. It therefore encourages us to bear ourselves before him as we prepare for the Eucharist. And then, you know, you have the, the word, whether it is as the scripture in the Old Testament, New Testament, the Gospel, the Psalm, plus the sermon or homily which is delivered. And all of these aspects of the ministry of the word, they are there to illuminate us, to teach us, to remind us of God, of God's will, and what is required of us. And uh, having heard the word, we begin our confession by confessing our belief in Almighty God. Our belief in God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our belief in God's care for creation and how he, in his love, descended in the form of the Son, died so that you and I can be liberated to be reunited with him. And then, we move to the next area whereby, as we speak about the intent, we offer prayers. And notice, the prayers are not only for ourselves, but we pray for the world in general. We pray for everyone who is in need of God's assistance. And it is only after that we begin now to focus on ourselves individually in the confession. That's when we know at page 123. And uh, you notice that very often the person leading the service will introduce the confession by calling for a moment of silence so that all of us can prayerfully reflect on ourselves and consider the things that we need to bring before Almighty God to ask for forgiveness, and at the same time, to make the commitment to do better. A very important thing follows after the confession. There's the confession, there's the absolution. But immediately after, there is the greeting of peace. And I'm just sorry that COVID-19 has put a certain damp on that. But we still share the peace. And the peace is significant, very significant. But what the peace does, it allows us to have a tangible demonstration of the belief and fact that we are in unity one with another, we have nothing against each other, and together we are ready to come to God's table to share in the body and blood of his son, Jesus Christ. The peace, the sign of peace, is one of the high points in worship. And if in any church, in any congregation that follows this type of worship with the sign of peace, if in any such church there are persons who cannot share the sign of peace for one reason or another, then something is terribly wrong. For it says that such people are not in unity one with another. And if they are not in unity one with another, then there's a problem there. For it, it is saying that the body of Christ is divided and the body of Christ cannot be divided. You cannot have individuals saying, I will not participate in the peace because I do not like so and so or whatever. If there is such a situation, part of being the revelation of God to others has to be that we learn to acknowledge the teachings of God 
And I want to take us back to St. Matthew Gospel, to the Beatitudes, <coughs> Blessed are the peacemakers. It is part of what is required of us. And so a church cannot be at war with itself. If the church, members within the church, is at war with itself, then it is going totally contrary to the will of God. And you have to ask yourself the question, what witness is it bearing? And so there's the greeting of peace. And when the greeting of peace is completed, we are ready to come to his altar, bringing our whole being, our time, talent, and treasure. That's why you have the offertory taken up at that point in time and presented. And I want us to draw attention to the offertory prayer at that time, and, in, and specifically offertory prayer B. We are at page 126. Because I think this particular prayer now clinches the whole reason for worship, the whole understanding of word and sacrament. Let us read together. Father, we offer you these gifts which you have given us, this bread, this wine, this money. With them we offer ourselves, our lives, and our work to become through your Holy Spirit a reasonable, holy, and lively sacrifice. As this bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ, so may we and all your people become channels of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Take your man again back to the disciples in the gospel reading there with John. They met Jesus. They did not keep him to himself, but they became the conduit to whom others came to know him and to serve him. And that, and that also then reminds us as to why we worship and what we are expecting by participating in word and sacrament. So that we, having been nourished upon word and sacrament, can be energized, can be reactivated, so that we, when we go out, others looking at our way of living can come to know, to love, and to serve Almighty God. Remember Eli, he became still. And his very way of living, preventing others from worshiping Yahweh. The Holy Eucharist, therefore, at this point, reminds us of why we feed on the body and blood of Christ. And you know, let us fast forward to participating now in the body and blood of Christ. And I want to draw our attention to the words of invitation after all the consecration and that aspect, but the invitation to participate in the sacrament. And there are several, but on page 146, form C, I want us to pay particular attention to that, because I think this is probably the most important summary of them all. I read, draw near and receive the body and blood of your Savior Jesus Christ with faith and thanksgiving. Respond, we do not presume to come to this year table, most merciful Father, trusting in our own righteousness, but only in your boundless mercy. We are not even worthy to gather the crumbs under your table. But you are the Lord, ever the same, ever merciful. Grant, therefore, Lord of grace and love, that we may so eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and drink his blood, that with bodies and souls made clean from every stain of sin, we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Acknowledging God's gift. For it is only by God's grace 
that any one of us can walk to the altar. It is only by God's grace that any one of us receive the body and blood. But we also recognize what this grace does for us. And we recognize as a symbol in this sacrament, this is the visible sign of God's forgiveness for us, regardless to what the issues are. And it is at this point that I suggest to all of us that we come prayerfully to the communion rail with fear and trembling, looking to God to be merciful to us and to enable us and to deal with whatever issues we are struggling with. Coming to the altar and as the hymn writer in the old prayer book, 773 would say, bringing all my burdens, sorrow, sin and care, at thy feet I lay them and I leave them there. This type of understanding and attitude will cut out from among us the notion of you going to receive sacrament. Hi, how are you doing? Hey, Danish. And engendering us a sense of awe, a sense of reverence, a sense of holiness that we are moving to receive holy things only by the grace of God. And when all of that is said and done, the crux of the matter is in what we refer to as the post-communion prayer. And when you look at page 148, I want us to just pull the last prayer. There are three of them, but I think the last one gives us a good understanding. Now let us read that together. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for showing us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Having come in, having received, we are energized and we ask for God's blessings to go out to continue to be the light of the world to whom others may come to know, to love, and to serve Almighty God. Let me just make this point here, that with this type of notion and understanding of Anglican worship, then out of the window goes any understanding of clamor for entertainment. Worship, as we understand it in terms of word and sacrament, it is not about our entertainment, it is not about our gratification, it has everything to do with equipping the saints so that they may continue to illuminate others to come to know, to love, and to serve Almighty God. I therefore encourage us to take to heart the words of the Collect again, and in particular the text, to direct our thoughts over the next couple of days as we reflect on this whole understanding of being sons and daughters of God, the manifestation of Almighty God to the world. Grant that your people illumined by your word and sacrament they shine forth with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
I invite us to stand as a firm of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed as found on page 106 of the liturgy book. Please turn to page 106. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Intercession form B, page 107, page 107. Father, we pray for your Holy Catholic Church. That you all may be one. Grant that all, every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, especially Howard our Archbishop, dear Paul our Bishop, priests and deacons. That you may be faithful witnesses of the Holy Sacrament. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. And all those who you Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. And I pray to the shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. We also come to share in your let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Let us remember all of us who are prayers in the prayers of the church and all those persons and things we have been praying for. We continue to keep in our prayers all those involved in the education of this nation's students. As this week, the first week of returning to the classroom comes to an end. Pray for God's continued guidance and mercy upon us all. God, in your mercy, Amen. Almighty God, to whom Amen. our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords to your will, and the good things that you dare not, or in our blindness cannot ask. Grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In a moment of silence, let us examine ourselves before Almighty God. Page 124, 1 to 4, form B. Let us therefore confess our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not loved ourselves as we ought. We are truly sorry and in humble repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. That we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen all goodness 
and keep in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Page 125, Form B. If you offer your gift at the altar and they remember that your brother has something against you, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us share God's peace with each other in the new norm. If you have not yet placed your offering in the basket, now is a good time so to do. As I invite you to bring before Almighty God all our cares, all our concerns, and forth our offering, as we cite the hymn 219 219. God is love, let heaven adore him. God is love, let earth rejoice. Let creation sing before him and exalt him with one voice. He who laid the earth's foundation, he who spread the heavens above, he who brings to all creation his love to another. God is love, and he enfolded all the world in one end. Let an unfailing grass be folded for every child of every race. And when human hearts are breaking under sorrows high and low, then the hand that serves the living deep within the heart of God. God is love, and God with blindness in the sin of the souls of men. God's eternal love and kindness holds and rides and even bread. Sin and death Shall never for all our sins and try to be. What is love? The love forever for all the people. Page 144, 144. As our Savior taught us, so we pray. Our, our Father in heaven, heaven. hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Page 145, 145, the second affirmation. God has promised to prepare a banquet for us. And we are those who are called to the supper of the Lamb. Lamb of God, you take with the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take with the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take with the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Page 146, form C. Draw near and receive the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ with faith and thanksgiving. We do not presume to come to this your table, most most merciful Father, just in our own righteousness, but only in your boundless mercies. We are not even worthy to gather and come to your table, but you are the Lord, ever safe, ever merciful. Grant therefore, O Lord, the grace and love. That we may so eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and drink his blood, that the bodies and souls may be in him for every state of sin, we therefore dwell in him, and he in us.
Lord, I am not worthy to come under my roof. Thank you, Lord, 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 my soul shall be healed. Post communion prayer, the last prayer from the page 148. Page 148, the last prayer on that page. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. And for showing us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son, and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you, and as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and forevermore. Amen. We close the reciting of the hymn 107, 107. The heavenly child in stature grows, and growing learns to die, and still his early training shows his coming agony. The Son of God, his glory hides to dwell with parents for, and he who made the heavens abide in dwelling places secure. Those mighty hands that rule the sky, no earthly toil refuse. And make of the stars on high and humble trade pursues. 
He whom the choir of angels praise, bearing each red decree, his earthly parents now obeys in glad humility. For this thy lowliness reveal, these you we thee adore, and praise the God the Father yield and Spirit evermore. The Lord be with you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Let me just take this opportunity to once again express our gratitude to the several media houses for carrying this act of worship. Uh, we are most grateful of this public service which you provide week by week. To have a very blessed day and week, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>